So Shannon Sharp had a very wild moment yesterday on Instagram Live, and after at first saying he was hacked, he did eventually admit it was him last night on his podcast. And in today's video, we briefly take a look at that situation and see if there's any repercussions. Tyreek Hill wanting a Miami-Dade police officer fired, as well as my current power rankings for all 32 teams heading into week two of the 2024 season, right after. First up, Shannon Sharp went uh, viral. Yesterday, I think it was morning. It was earlier on in the day, maybe afternoon, but it was because of some explicit content, audio only content, basically, that floated around via an Instagram live of his. I'm sure you know by now, but he accidentally, Shannon Sharp, quote unquote, accidentally went live on Instagram while he was uh, getting jiggy with it. Uh, with a female, nothing was shown in the video, but you could definitely hear what was clearly Shannon Sharp and another lady. Now, initially the live stream ended abruptly after several minutes and then a post went up saying his Instagram account was hacked, but he later deleted that post and owned up to what actually happened that evening on an emergency episode of Nightcap. I said, I just got to tell him the truth. My phone wasn't hacked. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a prank. It was me being a he healthy, active male. So yeah, he definitely wasn't hacked. And he said that he found out he was live from his marketing partner who called him and then somebody else on Shannon's team who had access to his account is the one who actually ended the live video. Jordan, the one that cut it off. Cause hell, I didn't even know it was on. Jordan cut it off. Jordan put the message up. So while he seemed pretty sincere in his explanation and his apology, he also made light of the whole situation with Ocho Cinco later in the live stream. I'll get it in. Real talk. Hey, Ocho, see, I, I don't, man, I'll be lying. I'm lying. Okay, lie. Hey, come on, I man. We... Sparks hard, Ocho. <laughs> and, you know, I, I hit one early this morning. So there you go. Obviously, it's very embarrassing for anyone's private life to be floated around out there like that, especially for someone like Shannon who has millions of followers and subscribers. But at the end of the day, it's uh, pretty hilarious. And I'm glad he owned up to it and even made light of it all. Now, it looks like there's going to be no repercussions from ESPN or any of the places he works, which is what I was hoping. Like, please don't punish this man for such a weird accident, especially when nothing was seen. And so with ESPN confirming they're not gonna do anything, that's kind of all she wrote with that situation, but it was a wild one. Now, something that is not a laughing matter is the whole situation between Tyreek Hill and the Miami-Dade police that occurred Sunday morning and has progressed. We have some updates throughout the week here. First though, as a quick reminder, Tyreek was detained and put in handcuffs on Sunday after he was pulled over for speeding or reckless driving or something like that, but he was visually estimated, I don't know why that's funny to me, but visually estimated going 60 miles an hour, okay? Then the full body cam footage was released the other day and it gave a more clear view of what happened after the stop. Tyreek didn't wanna fully roll down his window again and the officers responded pretty aggressively taking things up to a notch that was not necessary. Now, of course, Tyreek shouldn't have been speeding, should have worn his seatbelt, and could have responded more respectfully to the officers, even rolling down his window again quicker. But he has an explanation for why he didn't. And also, nothing he did warranted that amount of aggression. Anyway, one of the four officers involved, a 27-year-old veteran of the department named Danny Torres, has since been put on administrative duty, i.e., He's working at a desk for the time being instead of being in his patrol car. But Tyreek thinks they need to go a step further and fire this man immediately. Now, to be clear, Tyreek also admitted that he could have handled the situation better on his end. Quote, I will say I could have been better. I could have let my window down in that instant. And he goes on to say that he was trying to remain incognito to the public. That's why he was not really wanting to roll his window all the way down again and just keep it there. He didn't want the attention fans, cameras out, phones on him at that moment. But quote, at the end of the day, I'm human, Tyreek says. I gotta follow the rules. I gotta do what everyone else would do. Now, does that give them the right to literally beat the dog out of me? Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, I wish I could go back and do things a bit differently. So we shall see what becomes of the veteran officer that was placed on administrative duty and if he did enough to warrant being fired by the department after 27 years working there. Tyreek's lawyer says, Yes, and they are demanding that the officer be terminated effective immediately, but Torres's representation says the opposite, and in a statement shared that he should immediately be placed back on patrol duties. With all that being said, 
What do you guys think of the situation and how it's going to end? All right, next up, I want to give you guys my very own Cole Breaks the Huddle week one, kind of week two NFL power rankings, or at least as we head into week two. I'll drop these earlier next week. I know there's a game tonight, but I did want to get these out of the way and then kind of tweak them as the season goes along. Again, this is just my opinion. You may disagree with a handful of these. That's totally fine. Um, but I'm going to focus mainly up on the top 15 teams. But before I do, here's who I have ranked from 32 to 16. The Panthers are clearly the worst team in the league. Can't say their name without laughing. Then the Commanders, uh, I'm going to put them down there for now with their god-awful defense. Then Danny Dumps and the Giants. Mr. Punt on fourth and one, Antonio Pierce and the Raiders. Little Bo's Broncos. Will Levis's turnover Titans. Gerard Will Levis loves Mayo and the Patriots. The Cardinals. Falcons. Packers. Yeah, I have the Packers way down there because uh, Malik Willis, guys, he is the quarterback. He's been in the system for only a couple weeks. He's never won an NFL game. If it was Jordan Love, they would clearly be in the top 10. But I did dip the Packers way down right now until Love returns to 23. And then we can kind of figure it out from there. Then from there, I have the Bears and Saints at 21. Then from 20 to 16, I have the Cleveland Stains because Deshaun Watson, the Indianapolis Colts. They are getting there, but I need to see a little bit more from Anthony Richardson, just more time, uh, more playing time in general. Then I've got the Chargers, Vikings, and finally the Jags. I didn't even want to put the Chargers this high up, but I feel like they made some good changes in the offseason. I like Herbert. I like Harbaugh as a coach. And uh, who knows, maybe they can climb even further up these power rankings as time goes on. Now, 15, let's, let's talk about number 15. That's the Seahawks with former Ravens uh, defensive coordinator and now Seattle's head coach, Mike McDonald, getting his first win. Um, I like them here right around the middle of the pack. Thanks in part to Seattle's secondary living rent-free in Bo Nix's head. They have some injuries along the offensive line at the moment, but with a stacked receiver room and two studs at running back, they're going to go as far as Geno Smith can take them. How far? That remains to be seen. Now, 14, I'm going to have the Steelers. I know it's hard to feel great about the quarterback situation in Pittsburgh, regardless of whether it's Justin Fields or Russell no longer riding Wilson, but the Steelers have one of the best defenses in football led by a coach in Mike Tomlin that has never had a losing season in his 17 years as the Steelers head coach. If they can limit turnovers on offense and put just enough points on the board like they did in week one, even if it was all field goals, uh, this is possibly going to be a playoff team. I'm not going to say it's for sure, but very well could happen. Then I have the New York Jets at 13, and I know they got steamrolled in week one, uh, but that's bound to happen when you run into a buzzsaw that is the 49ers, who I have way up on the power rankings. Aaron Rodgers looked tentative at times coming off the Achilles tear, but his arm is still very live, which he showcased a couple times on Monday night. He also was doing a lot of changing up at the line based on the defensive coverage. I'm more concerned, though, with the defense for whatever reason than the offense right now. They have a great secondary, but aside from Quinn and Williams, they're pretty vulnerable along the defensive line, and the Niners ran the piss out of the ball with Jordan Mason looking like prime beast mode, abasing them, and this was his first ever NFL start. Now at 12, I have the Rams, which are a bit of an interesting one. They just took the Lions to overtime, and Matt Stafford and Cooper Cup look like their 2021 selves. However, Puka Nakua just landed on IR with a knee injury, and they have a ton of injuries along the O-line. I mean, their O-line is... It's not decimated, but it's almost at that point. Their defense is taking a little bit of a step back for sure with Aaron Donald retired, but you can never count out a Sean McVay team. A lot of people expected them to miss the playoffs last year, and they won seven of their last eight games and squeezed in. And Matt Stafford, in my opinion, is one of the best quarterbacks in the entire NFL. Now, I know this one might ruffle some feathers, but I'm going to have the Bengals at 11. I'm not convinced that Joe Burrow is 100% healthy. He was checking his wrist at the end of the game uh, against the Patriots. And they just lost to the Patriots, one of the worst teams in the entire NFL. And then they have a real shot at starting out 0-2 with Kansas City coming up this week. If Burrow is 100% and they can get Higgins back, who's not going to most likely play week two, then I think absolutely they can win 10 or 11 games and climb up the power rankings. But right now, this is where I'm going to have them. And I'm trying my best not to let my Chiefs bias speak here. This is just kind of where I see it until Joe Burrow can prove that he's going to be able to stay healthy. Now for the top 10, I have the Buccaneers. At number 10, they had the seventh best scoring defense last year, and they play in what is probably the easiest division in football. Baker Mayfield was the best quarterback in all of week one, and he's now in his second year in this Tampa Bay system. Mike Evans doesn't age, and they still have Chris Godwin plus Rashad White and the rookie Bucky 
Irving. At number nine, I'm going to go with the Dolphins. But it's important to note that the Bills and Dolphins play tonight. So one of, if not both of these teams will be on the move by the time most of you are seeing this video. Uh, we'll see how it goes, though. But these are my pre-Thursday night rankings, so keep that in mind. The Dolphins lost a lot of key pieces on defense last season, but this roster is still chock full of talent on both sides of the ball. They showed in week one that they can win ugly, and once their offense finds its rhythm, they should be able to be a top five scoring unit. The jury is still out on if they can actually win in the playoffs, but in terms of regular season, uh, I expect them to get a lot of wins. Speaking of the Bills, they're next on my list at number eight. Some would argue them a bit higher, but they just played the Cardinals, and that team is still to be determined, to say the least. Their offense, talking about Buffalo, didn't skip a beat without Stephon Diggs or Gabe Davis from the looks of it, at least in week one. Josh Allen spread the rock around, and he's still lethal when he keeps it himself, scoring four touchdowns, two rushing them in himself. Now, whoever wins this game tonight between Miami and Buffalo will have a major advantage in locking up this division, as I believe it's a two-horse race with the Jets being... Maybe a bit of a long shot at this point in time. Then, despite Jalen Hurts turning the ball over like his life depended on it against the Packers, I have the Eagles at number seven. Their offense looks pretty unstoppable with A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and the newly signed Saquon Barkley, who racked up like three touchdowns uh, in that game. It was pretty phenomenal. Their secondary should get better as their top two picks in Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene will only develop as the season goes. And if Hurts can limit the turnovers, this team is going to be hard to stop. Then C.J. Stroud is picking up right where he left off last year. And this is a big reason as to why they're number six for me. But this year, he's also got Stephon Diggs and Joe Mixon, both of whom balled out in week one. Diggs had two touchdowns and Mixon ran for over 150 yards and one touchdown. They gave up a handful of explosive plays against the Colts. But I expect their pass rush duo of Daniil Hunter and Will Anderson to start getting home more often as the season goes on, even though the Ravens lost to the Chiefs. They were one of the best teams in the NFL last year, and they literally lost by a toenail. So I've got the Ravens at number five. I'm not out on them, but their defense isn't going to be what it was last year. And Lamar Jackson running for his life every play is not a successful recipe. He's literally not going to make it to the playoffs if he keeps doing that. They got to get Derrick Henry going and hope that Mark Andrews returns to somewhat of his form. And if they can rattle off a few more wins, maybe they'll be even higher on this list. And some might think I have this team too high here at number four. And trust me, I really debated this one out myself, but I'm going to have the Cowboys at number four. They hung 33 points on the best defense in football from a year ago. And the addition of Mike Zimmer at defensive coordinator looks to be paying off already. I know there's a lot of questions as to whether this team can win in the playoffs, but they're coming off of three 12-win seasons in a row. And if week one is any indicator of this team and how they're going to look this year, it could very well be four in a row. Next up at three, the Lions showed they can win in a myriad of ways, and their versatility earned them a top three spot on my list. They can hurt you over the middle with Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta. They can bomb it over your head to Jamison Williams, or they can run the piss out of the ball with Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery, which is exactly what they did with Montgomery to win that game in overtime. Then they have arguably the best O-line in the league. And if their defense can hold up, there's no reason why this team isn't right back in the NFC Championship game. And hopefully it's Chiefs versus Lions. Now, the 49ers can also beat you in a million different ways. They're at number two for me, whether it's CMC or Jordan Mason, I guess, it doesn't seem to matter. Their O-line looked elite against the Jets. Kyle Shanahan is one of the best coaches in the entire NFL, and they have a ton of playmakers on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, Brock Purdy's great. They also got Kittle. They got Debo. They got Ayuk. Trent Williams, one of the best left tackles in the game. I mean, this team is packed with superstars on offense, and their defense looks absolutely legit once again. The defense throttled the Jets, and we all know that this team is almost unbeatable when they get an early lead in games and can run the clock out. So don't be shocked if we see a Super Bowl 58 rematch this year, even though I would prefer it to be the Lions. And finally, as long as Patrick Mahomes is alive and breathing alongside Andy Reid and Travis Kelsey, there's no reason to ever bet against the reigning champs. You can call me biased. I'm a Chiefs fan, but they're the clear number one for me. Their offense looks even more explosive with the addition of Xavier Worthy, and we haven't even seen Hollywood Brown out there yet, and sadly might not in week two. Week three, though, should be good to go. Anyway, they showed us last year that they can still win without explosive plays. I mean, they barely had any. But if you add that element back in, watch out. They did lose Legereus Sneed in the secondary. It hurts. But Jalen Watson played well in week one. And Trent McDuffie is one of the best corners in the league. Then Chris Jones is a monster up front. And we all know Spags uh, can scheme up pressure like nobody else can and is one of the best 
defensive coordinators, if not the best in the entire NFL. And uh, with that being said, there's my power rankings. Let me know where you agree and disagree. And with that, I'll see y'all next time. Oh,